Welcome to the Foresight Health Roundup podcast, Foresight Health's podcast series for healthcare revolutionaries. Outcomes matter, customers count, and value rules. Hello again, everyone. This is Dave Berta, news editor at Foresight Health. It is Thursday, October 5th. Our fall decorations are out, and there's a bag of freshly picked Macintosh apples on the counter in the kitchen. What could be better? They say an apple a day keeps the doctor away, but what about physician assistants or nurse practitioners? Or does that require the American Medical Association? And that's what we're going to talk about on today's show, new research that shows that more PAs and NPs are providing primary care to patients. To tell us what this trend means for the healthcare market and for healthcare consumers are Dave Johnson, founder and CEO of Foresight Health, and Julie Merchantson, partner at Transformation Capital. Hi, Dave. Hi, Julie. How are you guys doing this morning? Dave? You know, Dave, you're talking about fall decorations, but I just can't believe how hot it's been. They canceled the Twin Cities and Milwaukee Marathons last week due to excessive heat. I still haven't put away my shorts for the winter. And that this rate of climate change, who really needs Florida? Right. Yeah, it was in the mid 80s this week. Pretty crazy for October. Julie, how are you? I had the same experience. I was in San Francisco for the week and it was 85 yesterday and I was not prepared. So coming back to Seattle, I put my puffy on to get off the plane thinking, oh, it's going to be cold here. And it was hot in Seattle. It's weird. (laughs) I will say that shorts in Chicago are not a barometer of temperature. I'll just say there's very little correlation. So uh, (laughs) they aren't for you. They aren't for for me. Yeah, exactly. Now, before we talk about this new report and all the scope of practice disputes taking place across the country, let's talk about your experiences with physician assistants and nurse practitioners. Dave, have you ever been treated by a PA or NP? And if so, what was your experience? I fell while running a couple of years ago. Uh, When I got up, my left pinky was at a 90-degree angle. Ouch. Yeah. I tried to pop it back into place, but it was still crooked. A nurse practitioner at a nearby urgent care clinic fixed the problem for me. He took an x-ray, saw there were no fractures, and realigned the finger joint basically by pulling it and putting it back in place. I did chuckle when the bill described this activity as surgery. Insurance covered every penny. Can you imagine what this would have cost if I'd gone to either an orthopedic specialist or an emergency room? Yeah, yeah, good. Sounds like it all worked out. And there's a pull your finger joke in there somewhere that we could talk about <laughs> offline. <laughs> Julie, how about you? Has a, has a PA or MP ever taken your blood pressure or checked your heartbeat? Yeah, well, an NP fired me from my ob office after I had kids. <clears throat> and I've been seeing her for a couple of years. And she sat me down one day and said, you don't really need to keep coming here anymore. It's nice to see you, but you can just go back to your PCP. And I thought, oh my gosh, you just fired me. She was great. <laughs> so yes. <laughs> oh yeah. I've been fired. I don't think I ever heard that one before. That's that's t- too bad. I saw a nurse practitioner instead of my cardiologist for my annual heart checkup after he canceled at the last minute, and she was terrific. And I've seen a physician assistant in urgent care when I have a bout of bronchitis. You know, I need an inhaler and some steroids, and I'm good to go. Even I know that, but you can't get them without a prescription. Okay, let's talk about this new study in the British Medical Journal that everyone else is talking about. Researchers from the Harvard Medical School looked at 276 million visits by Medicare patients in outpatient clinics and skilled nursing facilities from 2013 through 2019. The percentage of evaluation and management visits, which basically are primary care visits, delivered by PAs and MPs rose from 14% in 2013 to almost 26% in 2019. For physician assistants, it rose from 5.1% to 8.4%. And for nurse practitioners, it rose from 8.9% to 17.3%. Over the same period, the percentage of visits done by primary care physicians dropped from 42.4% to 33%. And the percentage done by medical specialists dropped from 43.7% to 41.3%. 
It all adds up to 100% each year. I checked. Dave, at the end of last week's show, you challenged the notion that the only way to cut anesthesia costs was to cut down on anesthesia. You suggested that certified nurse anesthetists could do it better and cheaper. I know you've got a thing about the scope of practice issue. <laughs> what do you think about the study findings? Is this trend a, a good thing or bad thing for the healthcare market? And is it a good thing or bad thing for healthcare consumers? Good thing. This is a great thing for the healthcare marketplace and for healthcare consumers. You know, Dave, if I could wave a magic wand and do one thing in U.S. healthcare, I'd eliminate the indirect billing provision that requires all medical bills to be submitted under the direction of a supervising physician. Such a waste of time, energy, and money. No wonder physicians believe and act like they're captains of the ship. Service provision and billing should align around outcomes, you know, best result at the lowest cost, not process mechanics. For example, why do I need a licensed dermatologist to conduct my annual body scan for troublesome growths? A nurse or even a machine could be just as effective or even more effective at, at doing this really basic task. The only reason it happens this way is they can bill more money for it. You're right that this scope of practice issue is the one right now that's making my head explode. Uh, not that I've moved on from revenue cycle management. I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> but this latest one started in August when I spent a couple hours in the simulation lab sawing bones, threading catheters, and doing internal suturing with a da Vinci machine at the Mayo Clinic. And as I moved from station to station, I was just struck at how routine and mechanical all these procedures were. And every time I got to a new station, I asked the doctor supervising it, why do we need doctors to do this? Looks pretty straightforward. And I always got the same answer. We're here in case something goes wrong. All surgeons in the United States, regardless of the type of surgery they do, usually require 13 years of training, four years of college, four years of medical school, three years of residency, and two fellowship years. This is the equivalent of training bicycle mechanics with the same intensity that we train mechanics for airplanes or nuclear power stations. It's just a crazy system. Why not align training with the particular surgery, particularly for routine procedures like angioplasty? You know, as I sat there and thought about it afterward, why don't we have the equivalent in medicine of surgical mechanics? What I'm about to say is absolutely sacrilege in medicine, but I'm not even sure these surgical mechanics would need to attend college. You know, drone operators don't need to know how to fly airplanes. Near as I can tell, all they have to do is be good at video games. The current system takes very talented people, sends them to medical school, gives them an excruciatingly long training period, loads them up with debt so they can become, drum roll please, surgical mechanics. <laughs> <laughs> Other than to limit supply and inflate compensation, does this system make any sense? You know, thank God we don't send plumbers and electricians through a similar training and credentialing process. They'd cost even more than they already do. So surgical mechanics, Let's look at all these regulations and credentialing processes, and let's have them make sense. These contradictions or this misalignment between surgical task, training, and credentialing are only going to get greater as the machines become a bigger and bigger part of our lives. So you ask doctors at the Mayo Clinic why we need doctors, and they let you go. <laughs> <laughs> You got guts, Dave. I'll give you that. <laughs> I was having this conversation with Molly Coy the other day, and she told me I needed to hire full-time protection as I start walking <laughs> around the country. That might be, actually. Right, right. Yeah. Exactly. Julie, any questions for Dave? Well, Dave, I saw an interesting article about an uprising among veterinarians. So would love to ask you, what do you think veterinarians and doctors have in common? Well, the most obvious thing is they're both increasingly owned by private equity, right? <laughs> That's probably why they're having the uprising. Touche. You know, for over 30 years, we've taken our cats to Blum Animal Hospital, which is right here in our neighborhood in Lakeview. 
And Blummet has been just a terrific place. It's it's where Oprah used to take her pets. You know, the Chicago standard for high quality. Whatever Oprah does, the rest of us should do too. So when I was writing my first book, Market Versus Medicine, I actually had a segment in the book that made the statement that our two cats at the time, Baxter and Bailey, got better primary and specialty care than Terry and I did. You know, they had a medical home, which was Lum Animal Hospital. Dr. Dan, our vet, coordinated all the care. Baxter had hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, so he had his own cardiologist. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, yeah, he actually probably extended Baxter's life by, by at least 10 years. I mean, actually pretty remarkable. But the care was always coordinated. They shared medical records. There was transparent pricing. Uh, everything went through Dr. Dan. So I wrote this passage and I gave Dr. Dan a copy of the book and, you know, highlighted the page. And he had it on display in his office right up until the time he retired about three or four years ago. But boy, has the world changed since 2015, 2016. Private equity bought Blum. We now have pet insurance. We're constantly on the lookout for overtreatment. Prices have skyrocketed. And we are now in the same kind of battles with the insurance company over what they'll pay and not pay for. And so in that regard, Julie, to your question, it feels like pet care, which used to be superior to human care, has become more in line with human care. And that is not a good thing. So, Dave, do you think, you know, vets fighting against non-vets doing some of the things you described kind of parallels what's happening with medical doctors and NPs and physician assistants? I'm not expert on the area, Dave, so I'll just go completely into the realm of speculation, which, you know, I'm very comfortable with doing. But (laughs) I think lots of the professions are trying to hold on to whatever sort of credibility and responsibility they can have for procedures that can be done in better, faster, cheaper ways. So it wouldn't surprise me at all if vets are, you know, rallying against these new and improved ways of doing things in the same way that doctors and nurses are. Thanks, Dave. Julie, it's your turn. Uh, What's your reaction to the study findings and what innovations or technologies are you seeing in your part of the world that would push these uh, percentages higher or even replace most clinicians uh, for primary care? Well, I was working with community health centers 20 years ago, and they had team-based care down. And they had to because with their reimbursement structure, they had to provide access at the lowest cost possible, begging, borrowing, and stealing. So everyone they have is practicing at the top of the license. Like, you know, so they had this down. And now today, fast forward, it is interesting. You're seeing it in a lot of commercial models. I will say some of the models that are doctor created tend to become very doctor centric, where some of the models that, you know, some are doctor created, but some are entrepreneur, you know, non-physician created are really using NPs and PAs a lot more. Opry Health, one of our companies, practices advanced primary care and uses an incredible mix of MDs and NPs. And by the way, integrates behavioral health and uses coaches. I mean, they're managing the whole person, right? That's what Dave's cats expect. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. I was just talking to Blue Cross Blue Shield of Arizona yesterday. And they launched their Prasano model, which is their advanced primary care model, using a lot of mixed clinicians in their model. Village MD calls their NPs and PAs their advanced practice providers and claims that they are champions for their patients. I mean, there's a lot of buildup going on of some of the venture models to really make this class of clinicians feel like they are you know, one of the most important partners for their patients. So this is a big wave, you know, beyond just a, a small trend. Another tip that I found, which I thought was really interesting, is Cario, which is a company we're related to from a, one of the companies that it bought. And they talk about how physician assistants have the ideal skill set to lead EHR and informatics projects because they're more facilitators in the practice, and they're really excellent translators between nurses, physicians, patients, and other caregivers. And it makes them kind of more uniquely equipped to translate what's needed in the EHR and what's needed in workflow to actually support more than just the doctor-patient interaction. 
So Carrie was talking about how PAs could really develop their careers into more of the EHR and other digital health implementation and design, frankly, which I think is actually pretty interesting when you think about the need for that in the industry. And my last example is e-consults. Dave, you've heard of e-consults, of course, right? Yep. Arista MD, Rubicon MD, Picasso MD. I mean, these models are kind of game changers for primary care because they connect whether you're a primary care provider, a physician, or a nurse, or an MP, PA. They connect all those categories of clinicians to specialists. Even you're, if you're a specialist and you need a specialty consult, they're providing real-time clinical decision support. A lot of them are providing referrals and scheduling support and care coordination as well. And they're helping, you know, create the right path for patients who are seeing someone in the primary care realm. So this means that with these kinds of technologies, I mean, you could have, you don't necessarily need the physician. You could have a nurse with that patient in a rural setting, right? So honestly, the future is going to be defined by a number of things, but a few key vectors certainly is all the technology I just talked about plus AI. I mean, just going to self-care, going to virtual self-care, bot-oriented care as your first line is definitely the first vector of change. The second, I think, which is much more human, is you know when you start to see chief medical officers at these ambulatory care practices in acute care settings who are NPs, PAs, or DOs and not MDs, you're going to see a lot more change because there's still a control function at that level, just like the control function I talked about with physician-created, you know, innovative models that are still pretty doctor-centric. That's going to open up a whole new world of how the humans think about who the humans need to be. I love the irony of moving away from MDs ultimately is better for patients. <laughs> That's, yeah, not something most people think about. Thanks, Julie. That was excellent. I'm not sure it's ironic, Dave. Yeah. yeah, really. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. All right. Right. It's, it's true. Yeah. All right. All right. Dave, any questions for Julie? Well, uh, Julie, that was fantastic. And I just step back and sort of look at everything you just said and project forward a little bit with AI and expanded capabilities among non-physician primary care practitioners, does this country really confront a massive physician shortage as is so widely reported? You know, I have been saying this for, I'm going to say six or seven years now. And I used to say it pretty boldly. And then I got a lot of side eyes. And then I started to sort of whisper a little bit more. I don't know why I got so meek, but we are not looking at the facts of where AI, I'm not going to say AI, just technology and just proper connections and better use of our capacity in this country on just a physician level is one set of changes and all the other clinical levels can help support. I mean, I don't think that we have a physician shortage in the way that people talk about. We may have a lot of capacity misalignment. There is no doubt about that. We don't have the right types of physicians or the right types of caregivers in the right geographies or, you know, always in the right care settings. But at the end of the day, if we did a better job of utilizing all those folks through some of the technologies I just talked about, we, I think, would have a much smaller concern about our problem. But I think, frankly, the only people who are probably still concerned are the AMA. Yeah, that's interesting. Here, here's my million-dollar idea, and it kind of dovetails with what you just said. I'm going to invent an online symptom tracker that after you answer all the questions, and no matter how you answer the questions, it says, there's nothing wrong with you. Go to bed, right? Yes. <laughs> That's it. First, do no harm. Right? You know, because every symptom tracker I've ever used says it could be a sign of something serious. Go see your doctor just in case, right? That's how they all end. And that's if you can get an appointment, like you said, Julie, fantastic. Now let's briefly talk about other news that happened this week. It wasn't all bad, was it? Julie, anything else worth noting today? I have a really fun little tidbit. And it's really interesting when you think about it. 
I read this week, you know, you know, the company Toast, which is the restaurant management app. If you've ever ordered something online for pickup or delivery, you, you may have used the Toast app. And some Wall Street analysts looked at Toast, and this is like a, a bigger macro, like healthcare's impact on fintech. So Wall Street analysts looked at some longer term impacts on their stock, and they actually revised numbers down because they're expecting the appetite suppressant from, again, the GLP-1 drugs like Gozempic and Wigovi will have impacts on the volumes at restaurants as fewer customers order via Toast. So Toast will make less money. Wow. Yeah. Talk about a ripple effect in the market. Juicy. That, that's a good one. Dave, what else was in the news that caught your eye? So Julie's headline is toast is toast. <laughs> good, Dave. I like it. Is there a song in there somewhere? <laughs> uh, could be. Could be. Oh, don't start. No, 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 no. no please. please. <laughs> well, I've, I've been getting into some good trouble with as uh, former Congressman John Lewis used to say in Minnesota, Governor Waltz there has created a very high profile task force that launches this week to study the University of Minnesota's professional healthcare training and education program. And this is all tied up with the U's multi billion dollar funding request from the state to revitalize its academic clinical enterprise which I think is among the most ludicrous things in the world, that somehow this is going to lead to better health in the state. So I'm really watching this task force to see whether they come down on the side of more health or more health care. And by the way, this is not the first time we're going to confront this issue of public funding to prop up financially struggling clinical and academic enterprises. Yep. Shiny new patient towers. That's great, Dave. Thank you. And thank you, Julie. That is all the time we have for today. If you'd like to learn more about the topics we discussed on today's show, please visit our website at foresighthealth.com. And don't forget to tell a friend about the Foresight Health Roundup podcast. Subscribe now and don't miss another segment of the best 20 minutes in healthcare. Thanks for listening. I'm Dave Berta for Foresight Health.